Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Thanks very much. I'll be standing up and moving around. It keeps me uh, limber doing, during this uh, uh, time. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see you all here. It's always fun to talk about the weather, isn't it? It's, uh, let me begin our talk in which we're going to be talking about these issues of global climate change uh, that uh, really are in the news all the time, it seems now, by reading from something uh, from a news mag magazine, in fact, Newsweek. It says this. There are ominous signs that the Earth's weather patterns have begun to change dramatically and that these changes may portend a drastic decline in food production with serious political implications for just about every nation on Earth. Uh, the drop in food production could begin quite soon, perhaps only 10 years from now. Evidence in support of these predictions is now beginning to accumulate so massively that meteorologists are hard pressed to keep up with it. Disparate incidents around the world represent uh, to scientists the advance signs of fundamental changes in the world's weather. Meteorologists disagree about the cause and extent of the trend as well as over its specific impact on local weather conditions, but they are almost unanimous in the view that the trend will reduce agricultural productivity for the rest of the century if the climate ch change is as profound as some of the pessimists fear, the resulting famines could be catastrophic. I'm reading, of course, from Newsweek magazine, uh, April 28, 1975, and it's about the cooling world. Uh, so, as you can hear from that language, the media is given to rather stark language at times and perhaps not always the correct conclusion, in fact. Uh, the media likes uh, strong statements, definitive statements, conclusive statements, and scientists are generally not in that business. At least uh, initially when scientists study a problem, they're looking at the data and trying slowly but surely to be led to some kind of conclusion. But science has changed in the last century as well. And a well-known climate scientist, Dr. Steven Schneider, back when the uh, uh, issue of global warming started to become strong, uh, had this to say, to capture the public imagination, we have to offer up some scary scenarios make simplified, dramatic statements, and little mention of any doubts one might have. Each of us has to decide, and he says each of us, he's talking about scientists, has to decide the right balance between being effective and being honest. An interesting statement. So everything we see about global climate change and its reporting in the media and the scientists, I, uh, and among scientists, I think you have to view through these prisms, Paul. <laughs> uh, indeed, and, um, and I too welcome you all, and it's very nice to see so many familiar faces, and thank you for, for coming. The scenario that we'll be speaking about primarily uh, today is addressing this issue of the connection between global climate change and the hurricanes that we've been noticing. And there was a recent headline, and for those of you that, that uh, have not seen it already, this is the uh, the October 3rd uh, edition of Time Magazine. And there it is. Are we making hurricanes worse is the question. Um, and this has led me to uh, joke with Fred about a new part of, of this science, of the atmosphere. And we call it meteorology. <laughs> um, uh, there is also uh, some concern about uh, uh, the second slide will show us that there are 
trying to make connections between global warming being the culprit. This is a picture from, from uh, back when Hurricane Rita was first making uh, its approach along the Texas, Louisiana coast. And this young man was having a fun ride on the seawall at Galveston. Uh, obviously, it didn't make direct hit there, so the results were, were beneficial for him. He got back alive, not so much for some other people. There was a recent article, uh, editorial in the New York Times, uh, where, whose weather page we've been producing for about 20 years now, uh, just within the past three weeks. And it said pretty much this. It said, Katrina, Rita, global warming, connect the dots. Um, and, and it is those types of issues that we really want to address today with regard to the connections that uh, media can make that may not be all that scientifically sound. And we want to begin really by looking at uh, the facts first. But actually, there, this goes back to uh, a article that was uh, in the New York Times, speaking of the paper of record. Yeah, and I think um, this is actually, I think you would agree with me, Paul, this is, I believe, when the current real push in the media began toward uh, making global warming the very uh, pervasive issue that it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this was from June, late June, 1988. Unfortunately, the date was cut off, but I think you can, those of you in the front can read it. It says, global warming has begun, expert tells the Senate. And there were, uh, there was a Senate panel being um, held in the late, early part of the summer, but in the late spring of, of June 18, uh, 1988. And uh, the, the trend, he felt, uh, James Hansen was the scientist who was testifying, uh, said that this was, this was it. Uh, it's begun. And when we have uh, some of those sort of statements, that was a fairly bold statement to make in 1988. And actually, subsequently, uh, he's backpedaled a wee bit on some of those comments. Uh, but, but that led to uh, other types of things, such as this. Once again, we'll pick on Time magazine, um, showing the, the, uh, the globe uh, uh, kind of frying in a pan, indicating the, the almost certainty that we have uh, that this global warming trend is connected to uh, some of the other dramatic changes we've been seeing in the weather. And that's part of the challenge that we're going to be speaking about. Well, why don't we take a look at uh, our next uh, bit of data? Yes. And that would be the next item. And this actually shows uh, the uh, January to December, so annual surface temperatures uh, for the entire globe uh, for the period uh, since 1880 is on the left hand side of the graph, 2000 is on the right. There's no denying, at least in, in looking at the data, that the previous century uh, uh, tended to be cool. Uh, that is the 19th century now. I guess that's getting to be two centuries ago. Uh, and then there was this very interesting period in here. There was a cool spot uh, where the, the uh, global temperatures didn't seem to do much at all. And in fact, if you drew a trend line, there was actually from around 1940 to 19, mid-1970s a downward trend in the temperature. And then there has been this more profound upward trend in the measurement technique of global temperatures, one must point out that when we talk about, if you think about it, no one has ever, nor will anyone ever experience the average global temperature. Uh, it's not something we have to deal with. It is not really imp important to any individual human being. The only thing that's important is the distribution of global temperature. And so we assume that in an, uh, if there is a warming, uh, we might assume, and probably incorrectly, that everyone is warming up. Uh, and the chances that that are, uh, uh, is true are small. Uh, and the chances that someone is warming up a lot, and someone is cooling, and, some, and someone is not doing very much, that's the much more likely scenario in a warmed world. In fact, Fred's point's well taken. If we look back at the, that trend in the global temperature and that period from the late 1940s through the 1970s when there was a, a uh, trend line that was down, of course, the opening remarks he read from was, were in 1975, yeah. I believe it was, uh, speaking about that trend line, which, of course, had folks terrified. And I was around in those days. I remember 
uh, the tough winters of 76, 77, 78, 79. And at that time, there was concern that we were moving into or accelerating into an ice age. Uh, obviously, it didn't take but a generation to flip that around in terms of the media portrayal of, of what we're at. Now, we're not necessarily saying it's, it's quite so dramatic, but we are making the point that, that media tends to hype. Uh, and that's, that's the, uh, when we look at data, we don't see necessarily the same reason to hype. If we look at not only the uh, uh, world temperatures, but let's break it down and look at one of the best observing uh, network in the world, which is the U.S. temperature trends. And this is for the same period, going back to the, uh, to the 18, from 1890 or 1900 uh, through this past year. And on that particular trend, uh, you'll see that indeed uh, we, are, we are going up. But you'll also notice that there was a period in the 1930s and 40s uh, that were not quite as consistently warm, but in some degree uh, had as warm, if not warmer years than we currently are experiencing now. And certainly the U.S. temperature graph isn't quite as dramatic in its, up, in its uptrend as is the global temperature graph. What we're trying to introduce here is that when you start to look at the data more carefully, it gets more complicated. The world is a complicated place. Now, I might make uh, one point, though, that Fred said we'll never experience the the global mean temperature. However, the U.S. mean temperature, annual mean temperature, is 53, which is the current temperature outside, by the way. So <laughs> just, just as, a, as a sidebar. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the time when we would think we would most notice the warming, which, is, right. which is during the summer. And uh, even though it did change, by the way, in case you're saying, wait a minute, that looks just like the graph we just saw. Uh, but this is actually the summer trend. And if we actually were to compare all the different seasons, uh, winter, fall, spring, summer, we would find out that, that they're not all the same sign of trend. Uh, the winters have shown more significant increase. The summers have actually been fairly flat in their temperature. Now, there is a little bit of, a, of an increase in there. But for those of you that can see the red line, uh, this cluster about uh, two-thirds to the, to the left side, uh, that is the 1930s, a period of warmth during the summer season that has never been matched. Uh, and that is both with regard to the extent of the heat as well as the records that were set. Uh, there were temperatures as high as 120 degrees in North Dakota uh, during the 1930s. Um, that, imagine what the media would be saying today uh, if that had happened. Yeah, you could see those report. I could see them now, the reporters out there with their you know, sweat-covered uh, shirts and they'd be standing in the, there would be dust blowing by them. Uh, but it really is, uh, the, the 1930s was a remarkable decade in the United States for actually, it was dominated by warmth, of course it was the Dust Bowl as well, a tremendous climate anomaly that caused a huge displacement of people. Uh, and uh, it also had some very cold winters as well as we will uh, discover. Uh, and so uh, it's such a, it's periods of tremendous variability in the weather have always occurred and I suspect always will occur. The current controversy set, uh, centers around uh, how fast is the climate changing and is it changing in a way that is dominated by the activities of human beings. I think that probably summarizes it best. Let's go to the next graph. Oh, uh, the green line is just the trend line from the beginning of the graph to the end. Uh, this, in fact, shows you uh, at number of extremely hot days in the United States. It starts in 1930, ends in 2004. And the 1930s, when you just count hot days, uh, where the temperature varies by some threshold more than average over the United States, uh, one can see that you can't really even put, uh, you know, you can't, uh, even compare current summer weather in the United States uh, to the 30s. But of course, that's speaking about, about summertime. And we did mention that the trends have been, have been different by varying seasons. Uh, and uh, we want to take a look at, uh, actually, well, let's, let's briefly talk about precipitation. We'll come back to this. Because oddly enough, whereas the temperature distribution um, has, the warming has not been consistent uh, across the globe and across all seasons. The one thing that has been quite notable, especially in, in North America and specifically in the United States, 
this is the precipitation trend going back to the 1890s uh, through the most recent year, through 2004. And there is a, a remarkable trend there. In fact, if you look at the actual numbers, uh, there is now, a, and this is the U.S. average, there's approximately two more inches, almost two and a half inches of rain uh, falling per year now than there was at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Sometimes so, it's, yeah, it's useful to look at these graphs. In, when you look at them all at once, they can be confusing. But if you look at a little chunk of it, like this one, uh, the, this 30 years or so, back here, notice how many of the brown lines representing really dry conditions over a large part of the United States there are. And then compare it to this, this part of the graph from 1970 on. Notice how, f now there were, there were some dry years in there, but notice how few brown lines there are dipping really far down and how many green lines they are going very far up. Climate has changed. It was a dry climate there, it's a wet climate there. Uh, is it, does that mean it's going to get wetter forever and ever and ever? I doubt it. Yeah, we, we would be uh, amiss if we then extrapol extrapolated that line up and expect that by the time that 2100 rolled around that we'd be having uh, 10 to 20 more percent rain than we are right now. But you can see how when it comes to issues of policy concerning uh, how we're going to manage water, uh, that this becomes fairly important because the trend right now is way up and therefore, the tendency to waste water is also way up, too. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at uh, going back to my favorite season, as it, as it said in the beginning, of uh, forecasting snow. Um, uh, this, is, this is looking at uh, just the eastern half of the United States wintertime temperatures uh, from the period uh, uh, late 1800s through 2002. And when you just take a, a kind of a, a glance at this, there's a lot of lines up and down. Uh, doesn't look like there's any particular trend uh, to note. And these are, by the way, temperatures departures from normal. So the blues indicate when it was a cold winter, and the oranges indicate when it was warm. Uh, clearly, actually, one of the warmest winters was back in the, in the 1930 range, although there have been plenty of them recently. Also, one of the coldest winters was back in the 1930s. Yes. Interestingly <laughs> enough. Big extremes. Now, of course, uh, the generation I represent um, uh, was one that was uh, uh, raised by folks who told me how cold it was in their winters um, and how walking to school, you know, uphill in the snow and walking back uphill in the snow, uh, uh, it was just a, it was just a, 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 a terrible time. Um, and uh, there was mass transportation those days too. Uh, but but let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, segmenting this and just parse it out. And this is, the, this is the time when my parents uh, were going to school and, and uh, then getting into the later years, raising me. Uh, but uh, notice that the blues are by far in the minority. I mean, this is an incredible, that was the same graph you saw. We're just taking one segment out and looking at a 37-year period, or whatever this is, 36-year period. And we're seeing that, now, the winter of 35 was a tough one. There's no question about it. So most of the recollections of those tough days have gone by are of 1935. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't that, that all the winters were so terrible. In fact, most of them were actually pretty mild. Now let's flip it over and uh, take a look at uh, the time when, when Fred and I were, were growing up. Um, and lo and behold, uh, in the winters from the, from the 50s, and to the 80s, it's been tough. Uh, I mean, I had to walk to school. And, uh, uh, so, so clearly, um, how one segments the, the uh, temperature trends, uh, it, what period you look for, uh, gives a different scenario. And there's something very important uh, about that graph, as much fun as snow is. It tells us something very fundamental that shows up in a lot of meteorological data. And that is that the atmosphere operates uh, quite naturally in fairly strong multi-decadal cycles, something of order. In this case, we were talking about you know, 30 years or so, 30, 35 years, half a lifetime approximately. The weather behaves fundamentally in one way, and then it's not unusual for it to behave fundamentally in another way. Uh, just as that uh, global cooling article in Newsweek, they had just come to the end of 
30 years where the temperature, if anything, had a downtrend. But we were, so, so this tendency for weather to occur on scales of a few decades, give or take, and you'll see that that's part of the hurricane story as well, uh, is a strong, a strong natural rhythm in the atmosphere. It's a strong heart, it's part of the heartbeat of the atmosphere. And it's something we have to keep in mind when we start analyzing the data. Let's, uh, let's move on and, and uh, talk about another aspect of change that has been noted. Certainly the media has covered this uh, excessively. Um, and that is the total number of tornadoes. Uh, this is looking from the reliable period of record, which started in around 1950, when, when we were keeping fairly close tabs, and going all the way uh, into the past year or two. There's no question that there's been an increase in the number of tornadoes. Um, and in fact, you'll notice that uh, it, it looked like it was, it was rising fairly quickly in the 60s, and then it kind of leveled off and took a bit of a dip right around 1985. That's an important year to remember, by the way. Knows how it spiked up, and it just seems to have stayed at that particular level. Now, I think anyone looking at this graph would say this is an alarming trend. I mean, tornadoes are destructive, they are uh, unpleasant, and they continually are going up. Is this a sign that the weather has snapped and is producing extreme things in greater numbers? Well, we have a graph, I think, next of the total number of strong tornadoes. Uh, now, regardless of what time, uh, whether it's 1950 or 2005, if there's a strong tornado, someone's going to notice it. Some weak thing going through a cornfield in not very populated parts of Iowa might not be noticed, but a strong one will eventually be noticed. And notice that there is if anything, there is no trend in, in strong tornadoes. You could argue there's a slight downtrend, and there was that spike year when there was the big 74 outbreak, I guess that was. Now, a thing to remember here is that, is that the observing systems have changed substantially, too, since the 1950s. And, and in fact, that, that dramatic upward trend which, from which we've not come back down started around 1985. Well, two things were happening there. One, it was the completion of some of the tests of the Doppler radar system, which was then uh, began to de be deployed in the late 1980s and has subsequently been uh, sent out all over the country, which has the ability to see these twists uh, uh, going on in places that we never knew before. And the second thing happened, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, is that the, the camcorder became popular. Um, and that, and that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, the results of that in just a moment or two. Yeah, it is true. I mean, uh, there's nothing more dramatic than t a good tornado video. And, uh, uh, and uh, so in 1985, uh, we actually had here in Pennsylvania the most uh, destructive tornado outbreak that there has ever been in this part of the country. Uh, and wouldn't you know, there was a Penn State graduate uh, uh, visiting uh, from uh, Texas, visiting his uh, parents in western Pennsylvania, in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, which is near the Ohio line. And in 1985, in the infancy of home video cameras, he was out there ready to cover the event, I guess. And we actually have that video from what is now 20 years ago. And I find it, it's always interesting to watch tornado videos, uh, but I find this one to be one of the more interesting because what you watch happens in essentially real time. There are a couple of very small edits, but it'll give you an appreciation for what it's like to have a tornado come through your neighborhood. Let's uh, take a look. And there are a lot you can learn about tornadoes from this as well. Here, Ron, look. Let me zoom in on that. Okay. Notice his technique yeah, isn't great. <laughs> Look at this one. Here, bring that up here. I used a, a manual zoom. Go to the uh, temperature up there, Ron. Oh. You don't have the sound up here. Yeah, you have to have the sound on. Let me do the macro. 
for almost 100. Okay, I got your hand. Bring it closer. Well, that's deal. a pretty good looking hailstone. Interesting thing is they've, they've had a little thunderstorm with some hail. The tornado hasn't happened yet. Okay. That's really the way it, it normally goes. You get a down. thunderstorm and the tornado follows. Oh, look at down there. Take down there. Look at it. It's like snow. Let them show what the temperature is. It's going to check the temperature. <laughs> a true weather aficionado. <laughs> 76. Look at, look at Brian Lane. Look at the road. Yeah, this, this was, uh, uh, yeah, he was back for Memorial, Memorial Day weekend. Wasn't well, that something? There's a lot you see, it's not unpleasant out right now. There's no wind at all. No wind at all. Well, that was only about 10 seconds long. It's going to take a look at the sky here. There are actually a little patches of blue up there, but it's not, you know, there's a dark cloud. Now, I want you to listen carefully to the change that takes place. There's going to be a guy in a white shirt that walks through this fence, and then there's a slight edit in the tape. Listen to the difference in the sound. It's a lot of noise, Megan. You hear the low rumble now? That's that freight train sound that people talk about. Here comes the tornado. Huh? You don't need a degree in meteorology. See those papers belong to That is a tornado. Look, look at all the papers over there. That's a tornado. Yeah, it leaves. Yeah, but look at it. It's picking it up. Look at Dale. Here comes the tornado. Sure is. Holy shit. That's a tornado. Of course, they weren't Look papers, they were their neighbors' houses. Yeah, really. This is... Get downstairs. I notice it, it's close enough you can see the funnel. That's fantastic. But, but look, how, look how the trees are barely moving at this point. Look at all the papers. Getting very close now, a few hundred yards perhaps. Hopefully he is going to find a place of safety soon. I'm sure, I'm sure he's going to take his own advice and go to the basement. Oh gee. Oh, he's headed to the basement. No, 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 he's headed to another window. There we go. Watch. There it is, ripping through the back. And now he's jumped outside, and you can see it lit from the other side, so it stands out even better. Very pleased. There it goes. Be able to see, you can still see it out there. There goes a tornado. That was a tornado. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Wow. You got your three up two over there. I was looking, the roof's not off. Oh, oh, on I, I got it on tape. He's got it on tape. Now you'll see that this is exactly, you know, other than for a very small edit that was about 20 seconds, uh, this is how fast these things move through. Uh, yeah. Concerned parent, I'm afraid. I'm afraid uh, the the horse has left the barn, or whatever the approach. <laughs> but you see that it, you know, in two minutes' time, uh, the winds have, have have stopped blowing, and in fact, the sun comes out, uh, which is which is a dramatic part. And and it was during this time. This was in uh, the 31st of May, 1985, that 
the video camera became a household item. And subsequently, of course, there were many, many reports, many more reports of tornadoes uh, that have helped to augment the numbers that we see as far as the trend. So, so that the, both the atmospheric science technology as well as just the, the uh, number of home spun observers has helped to raise those numbers as well. And uh, the, the beauty of this tornado video, even though it's 20 years old, is everything you learn about tornadoes. So you can all remember that the tornadoes uh, follow the big thunderstorm. There is this rumbling sound. This guy was awfully lucky. That was an F5 tornado, the strongest tornado there could be. So at the core of that tornado, which maybe passed 150 yards or 200 yards from his house, the winds were 250, 300 miles per hour, and there was total destruction. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't realize how close he was uh, to, uh, to uh, not to being able to share his video with us. Yeah. <laughs> and, and plus, uh, it, the irony of it, of course, is here he's in Texas, you know, a state known for tornadoes, and he comes back and visits his parents, and what does he get but a tornado? Go right through their backyard. So, so I think this is an area where I think everyone agrees that our ability, our ability to observe tornadoes is responsible for a large part of that trend. <clears throat> Just the way we look at things is a, is a large part of it. And that idea needs to be brought to other things that we do in atmospheric science where we're trying to measure trends. And even all the stuff that we've shown you so far, the trends we're talking about are 100 years because that's about all we have decent data for. And the question, you know, the Earth has been around a lot more than 100 years. But we have hurricanes. Yes, and uh, this, this is, of course, what has, what has caught the attention of so many folks this, this particular year, and of course last year too, and we're not done yet in, uh, in 2005. Uh, when we look at the, at the number of uh, hurricanes and uh, intense hurricanes over the period from the mid-40s uh, through the early part of, of uh, this century, and this is from a very reputable source, uh, Chris Lancey and Bill Gray and some others, uh, Lex Avila, these are people who, who work with hurricanes all the time. Uh, we see that, that the, it's hard to notice much of a trend. Um, now, if you actually look at this in segments, you'll see that there was certainly a peak uh, in the late 60s in terms of, of frequency of hurricanes and, and tropical cyclones. And also there's been, there was a peak in the beginning in the mid-1990s. But as far as the intense hurricanes, that looks... There was a slight uptrend in the 50s and then a downtrend in the 70s and a little bit of an uptrend in the late 90s. And in fact, that multi-year period in there from the late 80s to about 1993-94 is the period of absolute minimum hurricane activity that has been observed while we've been observing this stuff. Uh, so the incredible uh, attention that is now coming to hurricanes, obviously, and for good reason, uh, uh, that they're going out of control in some sort of way, uh, was, was preceded by a period of remarkable quiescence. And this multi-decadal cycle that we talked about with respect to snow, well, these same people while, we don't, uh, while, while this period from 1944 is considered the modern era of hurricane observation, because that's about the time they started to fly aircraft reconnaissance into hurricanes, really there has been analysis done with the best data that has been able to be gathered all the way back to the, uh, to the mid-19th century. And the result of that, when you look at it from a, from a distance and try to see trends, is there is a fairly strong... 20 to 35 year trend in hurricane activity uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, that the period uh, that ended in the 60s, uh, the 30 or so peri year period that ended in the 60s was a period of high hurricane activity. We, the period that ended in the, low, uh, in, the, in the early 1990s was on average a period of low hurricane activity. And lo and behold, we are back into another period of increased Atlantic hurricane action. And recent storms, while a strong storm can occur in any time, even when we're not having many hurricanes, like Andrew in 1992, uh, we should expect, and Bill Gray, 
uh, the noted professor at Colorado State, has been saying for man, I mean, he was shouting in 1992 that we're going to go back and there are going to be a lot of hurricanes and places where coastal development has taken place are really going to see bad times ahead. The next uh, chart is, is one of my favorite ones because it, um, uh, it talks about the landfalling hurricanes from 1950 through 2004. So that if you're considering retirement and finding some beachfront <laughs> property, uh, uh, I, have, uh, yeah, I have a very specific place that I would recommend. Um, uh, so you can see me afterward. Uh, th there's this portion right along the north coast of Florida uh, that has not had a direct hit from a hurricane. In fact, when I guess I don't remember what storm it was. It was after Ophelia. Uh, but one of the, there's so many of them this year, I can't remember all their names. But we actually had one go in just south of Jacksonville, but it wasn't a hurricane. It was a tropical cyclone, just a tropical storm. But you can see that, that there are some places, like the Florida Panhandle all the way over uh, to New Orleans and, of course, along the upper Texas coast. These places are prone uh, to being hit by hurricanes pretty frequently. But there are other places that are surprisingly, in fact, that's why Charlie was kind of bizarre because it came in uh, in a portion of the, of the Florida coast, southwest Florida coast, that had really not been hit for a long time, uh, including uh, the area uh, north of, of Tampa that also has not been hit for a long time, too. So, so we see in here the distribution. This is, by the way, the place where they first make landfall. It doesn't mean that we don't have other, other effects. But, but notice and consider the, the price of real estate and also the, the frequency of... Um, of, uh, of or how much building has gone on from New Jersey down to uh, the Virginia Capes. And those areas have not had a direct hit. That is the first landfall uh, in at least 50 years. And in fact, that's why, by the way, you might remember in September of last year when, when Ivan was heading toward the East Coast, uh, many of our computer simulations predicted that it was going to make landfall first right in this area. Uh, in, uh, along the Maryland, uh, the Delmarva Peninsula. And people were absolutely terrified. I mean, not that it was any picnic for the four, poor people in the, uh, uh, along the Outer Banks, which did get hammered pretty hard. But, uh, but that area is, is more used to being hit. Uh, the areas farther to the north would truly be a catastrophe. Uh, an interesting uh, thing I'd like to show you as well is how these things vary by, by uh, region as well. And this, this particular chart, it's hard to see in the way back, but I'll just kind of narrate it for you. We're looking at uh, areas where there have been landfalling tropical storms or hurricanes, so something that has a name to it, or at least in the named era, which started in 1953, at least with, with people's names. Um, and in the 30s, most of these storms were, were striking in the, in the Gulf Coast area. Uh, and there's been, actually, up, in, up until the mid-1990s, a steady decline in the number of storms that were striking the Gulf Coast. Hard to believe, isn't it, uh, when you think about it? That was through the mid-90s. Uh, subsequently, we've obviously turned it around. What is also uh, surprising about this is that storms that strike along the northeast coast, that would be the area from Cape Hatteras all the way up to uh, Maine, have changed very little in, this, in these uh, six decades that we're looking at. So that is the frequency of a storm first making landfall you know, somewhere, Long Island, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, or farther to the north, uh, is about once every seven or ten years. And that really has not been any difference at all. So, so that uh, when we look at the distribution of these storms, we find that there is definitely a trend um, uh, that, uh, that follows this, this multi-decadal period. And, and the media really does not necessarily uh, show that they're aware of this particular aspect of it. I think, uh, yeah, uh, we wanted to kind of wrap it up here with, with what was uh, uh, our kind sponsors here from NOVA as well to show us a, a bit of a segment regarding um, a feature that aired earlier this year about hurricanes. And uh, this is just a, a snippet from it. It gives you an indication of how much we can do now to observe things that we couldn't just 10 or even 20 years ago. In recent years, forecasting the track of a hurricane has improved dramatically. But predicting its intensity, how strong it will be when it hits land, is still a difficult challenge. If you just grab your glasses there, I'll give you a test drive. We're going to uh, dive on into the storm. We are going to fly into the storm. NASA is using satellites to understand hurricanes, both inside and out. 
20, 30 years ago, when we used the conventional view of a storm, we could really only see the cloud top. We could see how big the storm was. We could see the white mass, which represented the clouds, and that was valuable, but that's all we could see. We were just sort of touching the hood of the car. Now we can pop the hood and look inside the storm. To do that, they're using a satellite equipped with weather radar, the only one of its kind. Much the way a CAT scan provides a three-dimensional picture of internal organs, the satellite's radar is producing stunning pictures of a hurricane's internal structure. And these unique images reveal something unexpected. Extremely violent thunderstorms called hot towers, seen here in red. These storms within a storm can reach more than 10 miles into the sky. When we see these hot towers, we think that they are giving us a clue that the storm is releasing a lot of energy. It's firing on all cylinders, if you will, and maybe a sign that the storm is about to undergo intensification processes. So you do think, preliminarily, that there's a link between the abundance of hot towers and how strong and intense a storm is going to be. That's exactly where we are in the research. We don't have enough evidence to conclusively link the number of hot towers or how tall they are to intensity, but our hypothesis is that they might be a sign or a clue that this hurricane is about to enter an intensification phase. And if this work pays off, forecasters will be able to predict more accurately not just where a storm will hit, but whether it will weaken or intensify just before landfall. So what, was, what we see here when we try to step back from this whole issue of, of all the things that get our attention is the earth warming up, our storms go, uh, like tornadoes and hurricanes going out of control, is drought more likely or are floods more likely? All these things that are at the heart of what the media covers, well, they want an answer. And unfortunately, I think the best answer is that we really have no evidence that any extremes that we may be having now are outside of the envelope of extremes that one could have expected at any other time. Could they be? Could human beings, for example, could our effects on the climate uh, be in there? I think they probably are. I think Paul and I would both agree. Wouldn't you say that our effects are probably in the climate somewhere? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a matter of magnitude and to what degree it's manifesting itself. Right. And if you pushed me against the wall, uh, I'd say, why did you do that? <laughs> uh, I, I would say that it strains my imagination and my scientific understanding to suggest that human beings are the dominant force in climate today. Are we a little bit of the puzzle? I think so. And th that's for the first time. Human beings are part of the puzzle. And what I think I know is that we, human beings, are the only part of the climate system that can contemplate our effects on the climate system. And that gives us the added responsibility to contemplate our effects and to do logical things based on what we know. But when push comes to shove, I think that the dominance of meteorology today may be just a little too strong. Our desire to believe we're responsible for everything you see go going on is a little too strong. And uh, I think our, our final slide before we open up into um uh, some question I, and answer. I time. buy these things at, you'll find this, this same story every three months at your supermarket checkout counter. <laughs> some variant on this, but unfortunately it now looks more and more like the cover of Newsweek. Uh, <laughs> but as you can see, uh, freak storm, uh, storms will be uh, sweeping the United States, killer tornadoes, massive storms, deadly fr uh, uh, floods, deep freeze. And indeed, February and March will be an icy hell, <laughs> <laughs> experts say. Yes, yes. <laughs> On that note, uh, we will uh, say thank you and open it up to some questions for me. Thanks very much for uh, joining us here today and, mm -hmm. and giving us a, a glimpse into the, some of the details behind the, the weather. When I watch you guys uh, uh, on the TV, the thing that really jumps out at me the most is the jet stream mm -hmm. as controlling the weather 
in the eastern United States and in, in, in the Midwest. Where does that jet stream come from? Why does it move? Why does it sometimes dip? And, and why does it have, seem to have such an impact on our weather? We need to sign you up for the four-year program. <laughs> uh, or at get, least Meteor 101. <laughs> uh, the jet stream is one of the, you know why the jet stream, uh, and we talk about it a lot as meteorologists too, uh, because it's a nice single thing that encapsulates a lot of the important stuff. The jet stream happens to occur, or these fast winds, which it's kind of a, we live at the bottom of an ocean of air. And this, the jet stream is a fast current running through it up around 30,000, 35,000 feet. And that current we know flows at the place where the temperature contrasts in the lower part of the atmosphere are their strongest. And we also know that storms get their energy from temperature contrasts. And we also know that storms are steered by the winds in the jet stream. So a lot of the important stuff that meteorologists want to tell you about on television can sort of be encapsulated in this jet stream thing, which is why the jet stream is always part of the, the television presentation. Uh, but the real important question is, why is the jet stream where it is today, and where is it going to be tomorrow? And that's where the uncertainty of weather forecasts come in. And, the, and the, uh, this river of air, uh, the jet stream, is not constrained by boundaries like our water rivers are. So it can wiggle and move uh, in great uh, uh, distances over short periods of time. And that is the challenge, because it, there are no banks, so to speak. This is your, uh, it's a rare shot to take a shot at a meteorologist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, t take out your frustrations. Yes. I saw an article that I thought was a good example of media presentation of some weather information, and, and you guys probably would be more aware of it than I was. I think it was taken from um, an issue of Science, a mm -hmm. magazine, with a couple of, and the article appeared a couple of weeks ago in which they, uh, said that there was a meteorological model of uh, the effects of carbon dioxide and water as impactors on global warming, and the model added in the effects of water as being a much stronger contributor to, to um, what do you call it, greenhouse uh, effect than the carbon dioxide, but the water, of course, is produced in the combustion of fossil fuels, too. And the article... Um, said that there was a model that included the water, and then there was a test that was done to attempt to check whether the prediction of the model was correct. And the test showed, and I can't remember the details of the test, but it showed that the prediction of the model was correct. And, and I thought this particular article was illuminating to me compared to the ones that you've been putting up on the screens. I would appreciate your comments on that. Uh, it's an excellent point. You know, th this idea about, about the uh, greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is really just the catalyst uh, to get more water vapor into the atmosphere. Um, and, and that, because the, the primary greenhouse gas, which by the way, the greenhouse effect is good. We would not have life on this planet if we didn't have that effect. Uh, so, so it's not all bad. It's changing the greenhouse effect that may not be all that good. Uh, but the the increase of carbon dioxide, which has a long lifespan, unlike some other gases, I mean, it stays around for a heck of a long time, is enough to, to notch the temperature a bit up, which then increases evaporation, which increases the amount of, of water vapor into the atmosphere. Mind you, that I think the amount that we're putting in from our fossil fuel uh, consumption is minuscule compared to the oceans. <laughs> uh, I think that's a very safe thing to say. And, but the increase of, of, uh, of water vapor by evaporation from the oceans um, is a very important fact. And the challenge that climate science has right now in making these predictions is that the, we don't understand uh, necessarily the important role of clouds as far as being able to model those very well. Because more water vapor in the atmosphere should mean also more opportunity for clouds. But clouds have kind of a, a double effect, uh, whereas they can help to keep uh, the lower part of the atmosphere warmer, they also reflect uh, the incoming light from the sun, which is really what drives our whole atmospheric engine anyway. So the sophistication of the models are getting better and better. 
the ability to replicate what has happened in the past, which is their test mode, hindcasting, because we're not going to be around you know, in 2200 to, to answer those questions, uh, has gotten better. But there are still many things that uh, I believe you know, honest climate scientists will say that we really don't know for sure. Uh, and, and certainly the physics of clouds and the role they play in this water vapor cycle is part of that. And you mentioned computer models. And indeed, all of the, all of the answers by their very nature about how the climate may change in the next century come to us from these computer models. Uh, and these computer models uh, are imperfect. Uh, goodness knows they've improved a lot. But they are imperfect. And the thing they do least well is the thing we said was most important. It's not what is the average temperature going to be, but how are things going to be distributed around the globe temperature and precipitation wise. So even if you accept the mean temperature answer, the real details in how it's going to affect uh, human beings and the global ecology for that matter comes down to the distribution, which we really aren't very good at. An interesting thing I have noted about the whole controversy within the science related to global change issues, and I don't know exactly why this is true, is that scientists who have spent much of their time and their career dealing with models, who are modelers by trade, are more likely to believe that the trends that we now see are uh, a result uh, uh, are the beginning of a long-term secular trend that has no stop toward warming. Uh, whereas people whose scientists who work primarily with data, interestingly enough, are less inclined to jump on the bandwagon. It could be that the people who spend their time really digging into data have a little bit more doubt, a little bit more respect for the natural variability that the data show, and a little bit more doubt about what the modeling suggests. I don't know how you feel about that issue. I mean, you're a state climatologist, yeah. Paul. <laughs> don't they deal with data? <laughs> we deal with lots of data. Um, and, and the challenge is that the, the trend um, is not uniform. And therefore, the prediction is not uniform either. And I think that, that's, a, that's a safe thing to say. Um, as far as, ha you know, there's no question there's been a warming that has occurred in the past 25 years. Um, the, the data shows that. Uh, but the data also shows that most of that warming has been uh, in the polar regions. Most of that has occurred at night. And most of that has occurred d during the polar winters. Um, now, the models that uh, predict climate change also say that's consistent with what they would expect. Um, so, so there is some agreement there that this is, this is what uh, the trends would show. Uh, the problem is that, is that um, the models are being trained on, <clears throat> on data that you know, shows that too. So part of it is that you know, we're kind of verifying it by what we already know and therefore extrapolating it from there. Uh, that's not to say that, that, they, you know, that uh, no, none of the models show cooling, except perhaps localized cooling, because of large changes in ocean currents. And this is a whole other aspect, that, that the global climate models really are just beginning to uh, assimilate, which is the role of, of deep ocean currents and how their changes uh, will affect the global climate system. Uh, there are attempts, and uh, some of them are, seem to be pretty good uh, to be able to model that and to be able to show uh, changes. But some of those changes come up with rather striking um, outcomes, including a rapid cooling for, for at least several decades in uh, northwestern Europe um, because of a change in, in, the, uh, in the Atlantic Basin circulation. Uh, now, that's not just that the, the planet still gets steadily warmer, but there are these pockets of change that go against the grain, much like the predictions for precipitation trends uh, way out you know, many, many decades from now uh, show areas of, of, of uh, central parts of many continents becoming very dry and coastal areas becoming much wetter. Uh, those, are, those are trends that, quite frankly, um, I don't know how good they are. 
I mean, heck, we can't even forecast how, whether it's going to rain much, you know, a week in advance. Uh, I'm not positive as far as for precipitation that there's a lot of credibility uh, to forecasting trends of precipitation decades in advance. We're much better at temperature than we are precipitation. And yet precipitation is a very important part of the weather and the climate system. I want to thank you for the moderation you've introduced into this very volatile subject to which we have all been subjected <laughs> enormously. And ask, then ask a question about influencing local affairs. We very frequently are hear about something that a plane can go up and do something to do and inject something into a local system. And I wonder what, uh, can you survey that for us and tell us what uh, is working and what might we look forward to in the future? So your, uh, real, your issue is can we uh, modify the climate on local, on lo on local scales? Well, this is, a, this, is, yeah, this is an interesting uh, issue. Certainly there are, I think even now, there are people who, there are companies that seed clouds out in the plain states and things of this nature in an attempt to, to uh, uh, create rain. I think there's fairly s uh, straightforward science that suggests that it, uh, certain kinds of cloud seeding should produce a, a local change in the cloud that will yield rain at some point. Uh, the issue of, of, of using, a, I'm always skeptical of attempting to engineer the weather. Uh, it, it's, it, it's very difficult, I think, to uh, contain, it's, it's, an, it's an uncontrolled experiment. And I think that that's why when they attempted to seed hurricanes to try to locally change the nature of those storms uh, back in the 1960s, uh, eventually they decided, well, we really can't predict all the things that are going to happen when we do this, so let's not do that anymore. And in the case of, of local scale climate modification, I have uh, no doubt that there will be continuing efforts to think about how to do that, but I have my doubts that it's going to lead to anything uh, fruitful. I guess I would spend my money in other areas. <laughs> well, in one of the areas where it is being spent, um, and it's actually a byproduct of, of some of the advances in the, in the um, military complex um, is creating <clears throat> drones that will actually fly into hurricanes. Uh, and the first successful uh, drone experiment was accomplished when Hurricane Ophelia was uh, moving northeast away from the, uh, the coast of North Carolina. And a drone was sent in that was monitoring uh, the temperature, winds, pressure, you know, humidity and so on uh, through the hurricane and then successfully came back after sending uh, a, a fair amount of data. Which of course, the great part about that is that no longer are we putting people at risk, you know, uh, to uh, fly into these storms. Of course, they've been doing it for, for uh, 60 some odd years. Uh, but, but also it means that if it, indeed it does work, uh, the opportunity to use funds to uh, uh, study these storms when they're pretty far away, too, uh, are before us as well. I think uh, that what Paul brings up, and as it relates to this global change issue, there's one thing that we should do uh, in the next century, is have one heck of a good global observing system so that our data is reliable and agreed upon and global in nature so that we can really start to uh, make strong statements based on reliable data over long periods of time. It's going to take a while to get a long period of good data to make good statements about how our global climate is connected and how it's changing, but that's one area that I would be, uh, I think, uh, deserves some attention. Yes. I guess I, I guess I also enjoyed your data um, and the explanation of some of the uncertainties. And I guess I had a question. Um, I had the opportunity to have a dinner with Gary Clark, from who's a climatologist with the University of British Columbia, and we were talking about some of the data and the uncertainties as well. And he was under the impression that most climatologists believe that although there is this uncertainty, that change is happening, and that. Uh, you know, somewhat less of them believe that humans 
are causing it or are a large part of the cause. So do you feel that, I guess the impression I got from both of you is that there is still too much uncertainty to tell whether climate was changing and even more uncertainty that to say whether humans were part of it. So do you feel like you're in the majority in that view or do you feel well, like it's... Um, no, I mean, it's definitely changing. It's always been changing. <clears throat> in fact, to say climate change is to, is to say like a round circle uh, because it's redundant. Uh, the climate by its very nature is changing. Uh, and there's no question you know, that, that, the, that we can uh, better describe those changes today than we could uh, 50 years ago. Uh, the role of human impact on that is still, I think, questionable uh, as far as what percent is caused by, by uh, our activity. Uh, there is a role. Uh, the degree of that role, we don't know. Um, there are some who feel vehemently that we are messing up the climate system terribly and it's irrevocable and, if, and in fact we're just going to have to live with the mess we've made. Um, that is a fairly potent group of folks. Um, there are other people who, who do kind of play the role of, of see no evil, hear no evil, who say, no, no, you know, this is, this is just natural variability. I don't think that would necessarily be uh, a smart approach either. But the fact that it's changing is, is, is inevitable. Um, the issue is, can we correctly uh, model those changes and make reliable predictions so that we can make policies that are, are helpful for us and for our children and grandchildren and so on. Um, that is still a point that's being argued all over the place. And clearly there's no, there's no um, decision that's been made uniformly about that. I think there's a strong emotional need though uh, if, if we all agree, and I think most people agree, that humans are now part of the climate system and I think humans uh, who uh, feel the responsibility that I suggested we have because we can contemplate our change, uh, uh, the effects of our change, would uh, desperately want to be able to do something to help if we're messing things up. So there's a, there's a desperate need to want to, oh, I wish we could help. And that may lead us in directions of trying to help but we really don't fully understand the problem and the thing we do really doesn't help at all. Uh, and I think that's the, the state we're at right now. I think no one wants to mess up the climate in a bad way for anybody. And if we're doing that, we really would all want to stop doing that. But I don't think we're at a point where we can say we're doing that on a global scale. Yes. You mentioned that the uh, sun is the driver of our weather systems and the sort of uh, perhaps dwarfing us as humans. Um, I wonder, this is sort of a two-part question, but it may be a one-part question. I wonder first if you'd comment on the effects of such things as uh, sun's, uh, sunspot cycles on, on weather and uh, whether there have been changes uh, during the periods that we've really been observing them. And the second part, or maybe it's part of the first part, I wonder if you'd comment on reports that um, one of your uh, competing stations on cable, PCN, they run the Deutsche Welle um, system uh, at night, and the German scientists, I haven't seen this in any American reports, but German scientists have been um, tying uh, what they say is a flip in the Earth's uh, magnetic pole to weather systems. Uh, their claim, to make it as simple as possible, is that during this long period when the, uh, of instability, when the Earth's magnetic pole is flipping over, which apparently it's in the process or the beginning of the process of doing now, during that period, more sun comes through. And according to some of their models that they've been running, and again, this is the only place uh, this apparently has been uh, uh, said, according to some of their models, we're in for up to a thousand years of more intense sun. In other words, they see this as affecting global warming and they further state, and this I would think is very controversial judging from your comments on humans, they further state that uh, all human activity over the past 4,000 years in terms of agriculture, burning fossil fuels, species extinction, uh, deforestation, all of those things, has kept in bay a return of the Ice Age. 
and they claim that it'll be kept at bay for up to another thousand years because of this flip in the magnetic pole. But at some point, these things will end, the burning of fossil fuels, human activity, and so on, and that we're in for a real return of the Ice Age. I wonder if you could comment on that. I'm willing, I'm willing to jump on that bandwagon. In fact, the one prediction of which I am sure is that it's going to be colder 10,000 years from now. We, uh, the, we, we have, and you can hold me to that. <laughs> uh, but uh, but just in general, the, the series of comments you made, I think, are fascinating because they show another thing that I think uh, is important, that we, another thing I'm sure of, is we know only a very small percentage of what can be known about how the climate works and how the Earth atmosphere system works, that what we know is so tiny compared to what we can know about how it all works that we need you know, a little humility when we come to making predictions about what's causing what causing what, I think is important. And these scientists who are working on the magnetic field question and the idea of how does the sun, the variation in, in, in solar activity affect our climate uh, is, I think, uh, certainly, it's certainly part of the equation. Yeah, this, uh, when the sun dwarfs all uh, compared to, you know, the impact that we think we might have is nothing compared to a, if there was a 5% change in the uh, amount of energy from the sun to the earth, uh, you know, it would be enormous in terms of its impact on our climate system. Uh, and the, the issue of sunspots and, and the cycles therein, I mean, we know that in, in days gone by uh, from the climate record that there were these periods of, of rather dramatic cooling uh, in the 1600s uh, associated with, <clears throat> with a minima uh, in sunspot activity. Uh, and we're aware of the fact that um, uh, these things, we don't know what the period of that is, by the way. I mean, we call it you know, a minima, but <clears throat> it may come every 400 years, for all we can do. It may come every 425 years. We don't know. Uh, and, and changes in the uh, amount of energy from the sun will have enormous impacts on our climate. So, so it's very, whether it's, uh, it's related to this uh, swapping of the magnetic field, I don't really know. Um, but... I do know that, that to discount the sun would be a, an egregious error. And I've saw, uh, you know, just to show you these weird connections that are endlessly fascinating if you like the weather. Uh, it, it, you know, you've all heard of El Nino. Uh, that, that's the media loves El Nino because it's short and it sounds like a professional wrestler. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the whole idea of uh, Here's an interesting connection. There has never been a strong El Nino during the minimum in a solar cycle during our data. So when there's a solar min, there's no El Nino. Are they related? Maybe. Part of what science tries not to do is take two things and say, oh, I see that, I see that, those must be related. But it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Let's look at that more. Isn't, uh, it, it's connections like this. It's, it's this sort of stuff. Uh, that, that flow out of observational data that, 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 that lead me back to my comment that we have so much more to learn about this subject that it's almost, uh, it's very humbling. First of all, I want to say, uh, Paul and Fred, that I really appreciate your local and regional forecasting, and I've watched it for years and years and years, and I found it to be very reliable, uh, so much so now that your sure bet segment now I've tied into my personal portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm losing money now. A <laughs> uh, question I had for you, I was going to ask about sunspots, but the previous gentleman did a very good job in doing that. But I have another question as well concerning the global uh, changes and the global reliability of reporting. You touched on that, Fred, about you would like to see something globally uh, to be consistent. Uh, satellites can do only so much. It's the observation on the ground. And in some of the rem most remote spots of our globe uh, are some of the most cataclysmic uh, weather conditions. And I wonder if you could comment on how those kinds of observations might affect the global forecasting phenomenon. Well, you know, it is true. 
uh, that uh, you know huge swaths of the land area of the globe have limited instrumentation uh, and not necessarily instrumentation that's maintained the way we maintain our instruments in the United States. And the uh, statistical hoops that you have to uh, fall through to come up with the numbers on temperature tr trends globally are many in, in attempting to standardize the data that we have. Uh, it's kind of interesting that 11% of the land area of the Earth is the old Soviet Union, where you know 10 or 20 years ago the main thing might not have been taking the temperature in the morning. You know, there's uh, when you when your empire is collapsing, uh, there may be something else going on. Uh, so uh, this whole issue of being able to measure the, uh, measure what the Earth is doing in a reliable and consistent and, and in a way that everyone agrees upon, I think is is critical to our understanding of the changes that are, may, uh, that, that are certainly occurring in the years ahead. The satellite observations um, are crucial to this. And, and the satellite era really goes back to 78, 79. Uh, and the data from the satellites, because uh, granted the land areas are important, but you know 70 percent of the Earth is covered by water, and the changes are going to be very significant there too. So the, the better we can, we can either train the fish to speak, uh, or perhaps uh, the, the better our observations are uh, over the oceans, uh, I think we'll have a better, it will, we'll have more valuable input, initial conditions into our, our numerical forecasts. The, the era of the uh, satellite, of course, there, there's two different types. There are the low orbiting polar ones, which really can see pretty close. And then there's the geostationary ones, which, which uh, get us the big picture, but, but they're a little bit more limited in their ability to see down to the, to the surface. Um, the, the fact that, uh, that the whole Earth is now monitored by global satellites uh, is good. Uh, now uh, the next step is the, is, the, is the exchange of that information. Um, so that, uh, that there's a, red, I mean, we exchange, the U.S. exchanges its data freely. Um, Europeans have been pretty good about that too. Uh, on the other side of the world, they haven't been so friendly about that. Uh, the uh, Japanese have their own meteorological side. They, they've been pretty good about it, but, but India has actually been fairly resistant to share their global uh, ob observations. And it's actually been primarily for military reasons, um, that they felt the data would be used to, to harm them. Um, and, and it's those sort of barriers that really need to be broken down in the sciences, you know, that, that allow us to be able to get a snapshot of what's going on all around the world at the same time, um, which is really what synoptic meteorology is about, um, so that we get some idea of uh, how these changes are occurring and, and to the detail that, we, that will help us to make uh, uh, better forecasts and, and wiser decisions. Well, like the previous speaker, I've, I've been a long time uh, fan of your program. And I mentioned specific events that happened a long time ago, but I won't. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking of Bastardi's famous prediction of the 25-inch uh, snowfall that never occurred. But anyway, uh, it goes back a long time. It's been superseded by other such predictions. Uh, yes. Sure. <laughs> anyway, no, I wanted your, uh, your comments on the Weather Channel, because I think in the whole question of media, uh, I think that in addition to the tabloids, that uh, perhaps the Weather Channel has had a little effect. On, I know there are a lot of Penn State people in the Weather Channel, so I, I don't want to sound like I'm knocking them, which I am. But uh, <laughs> it, it strikes me that, well, I remember when they first said they were going on 24-hour Weather Channel, I, oh boy, a weather freak like me, this is, this is heaven, I won't have to wait for, I can just watch them any time. I started watching them regularly, but now I've noticed well, stating it very bluntly, they hype the weather a great deal. Um, you can tell it on their faces. When you have a hurricane coming, or you know, making its track uh, northward, and there's maybe a two or three uh, millibar rise in pressure, uh, indicating the thing is calming down a little bit, they look a little sad, you know. Well, I mean, I can understand it, because here they are, uh, they're, they're, they're fighting prime time television, and uh, what do they pay their, their, their actors or their, 
their, their celebrities. <laughs> instead of you know, instead of getting a, a rock star for four or five million dollars or something like that, they just sit around and wait for a hurricane or a blizzard. Or something. Well, anyway, uh, I said I wasn't going to knock them, and I shall not say another word. But what? Are, what? Are, uh, how much effect do you think the existence of something like the Weather Channel has on our current um, acceptance of uh, sort of wild stories about weather out of control? Well, here's what I believe. Uh, the Weather Channel is part of it, and it's true of the media in general. Nowadays, there is so much coverage of weather. At the lo at local news level, it's always a story, national news. Uh, regardless of where it is, there's a camera now to take pictures of all the things that happen with the weather around the world. And you're sitting there in your living room trying to relax, and they're shooting another storm at you from, from uh, one part of the globe or another. And someone who is not, uh, who's just taking it all in has to be sitting there and saying, wow, this thing's out of control. Look at that. You know, there's a storm every day somewhere. Uh, but it ha And so the Weather Channel, uh, of course, they have storm stories and they have animal storm stories now. <laughs> but you know, it's all storms. All storms all the time. Why? Because they're, it's interesting to watch like the tornado video. And, uh, but I think it does contribute in the, just in a, in a kind of vague way to this sense that the climate may be churning in a way that it hasn't churned before. But I think it's the media that's churning in a way it hasn't <laughs> churned before. At least, uh, it's cer certainly the media is churning. I, I, think, I think I heard a line. Um, it was spoken just really glibly, and, and one of you know many billions of words have been spoken that said, "The weather <clears throat> is worse than you can imagine." Yeah, yeah. yeah it's true. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think I want to imagine it. Hi, um, you briefly alluded earlier to the fact that um, a lot of climate models are showing you know basically an endless upswing in temperature, and that those are basically trained on um, data starting essentially in the 70s where the um, uphill temperature swing started happening. Have there been any climate models that have tried to start with initial conditions, say, back in the either mid-1900s or going back to, say, even 1900 and trying to model the climate swings that we've observed, like the hot period in the 30s, the cool period from the 40s through the 60s? and um, I guess if you could talk about sort of initializing models and the, maybe the difficulties associated with that, because wouldn't it be, um, wouldn't we be able to get better predictions if we could have a model that would actually then predict and follow the century of data that we have? Oh, there's no question. In fact, uh, uh, the models have been initialized with information going back uh, more than a century. And some of the uh, other folks who are in paleoclimatology are looking at reconstituting events of, of millennia and multi-millennia ago. Uh, and in fact, that it makes complete sense is to try and re-simulate what happened uh, based upon some of the most important effects that we understand related to, to uh, global climate change. Uh, in fact, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uses the most sophisticated of those models. Uh, that includes uh, the increase of, of uh, greenhouse gases. It includes uh, changes in, in sulfates, uh, which play a role. It, it includes volcanic activity. Um, and, uh, and indeed, <clears throat> those models are fairly good at replicating what has happened in the past century or, or more. So uh, no, the, the approach is smart. Uh, it's the, the issues are how good are we at the physics? Um, and that is the issues of, of, uh, of precipitation distribution, cloud distribution. Um, those issues, uh, deep ocean currents, um, those are the questions. Now, we can replicate uh, what has happened pretty good. Um, and in fact, the researchers are doing an excellent job of that. And the issue isn't, isn't necessarily that, that we should, that this should be stopped, absolutely not. Um, the, I think I feel more compassion for the scientists who are, who are modeling, who are being you know, put into a corner to have to say something. <laughs> Uh, before they can even walk, you know, in terms of, of their own numerical model. They're, they're being, uh, this happened in 85. I remember the EPA put out a report uh, because they were kind of required to since they just spent a big chunk of federal change and they had to show some, uh, some outcome, you know, for, that's for the good of the country. 
And the forecast was that in, within 20 years, by the way, this is 20 years after 1985, uh, Cleveland would be as warm as Atlanta. Uh, that was the forecast from, from, from this simple uh, model that was run then. Of course, you know, Cleveland is not as warm as Atlanta. Now, on any one day, maybe this past summer they were, uh, but in the mean, they are not. Uh, and, and I think that that's part of the challenge is to kind of take off some of the, the monkey on the back of some of the scientists, uh, asking them to do things that their models cannot do yet, and let's, let's give them better data. Uh, let's let them do the, the physics as well as they can so that we can come up with even more reliable. And let's also be honest about what the uncertainties are. You know, is this plus or minus one degree, or is this plus or minus 10 degrees? <laughs> you know, that makes a big difference. My question probably has a very short answer, but um, uh, we live on a planet that actually has a pretty fierce furnace in the middle. Mm -hmm. does, the, the, does this in any way enter into meteorological thinking? It's, it's hot down there. <clears throat> uh, only when our forecasts are wrong and somebody wishes us to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that I've seen a lot uh, on the issue of uh, how the core of the, the planet uh, may affect what's go going on uh, uh, at the surface and in the atmosphere. But I do know that just the way we think of... Um, the, uh, we as humans think of the ocean as separate from the air. You can easily think, I've heard it, and I once thought this was a beautiful phrase, that they are just our planet's fluid envelopes. The ocean is a fluid, the air is a fluid, and they, th th this is all part of one whole system. Just how, and, and the question about the magnetic field, the question about the core, the question about all these, what may be changing in terms of the orbit of the Earth with respect to anything, I'm sure it's all part of the puzzle. How big a part of the puzzle? I don't know. I suspect the molten, I think if we can figure the other stuff out first, I'll get back to you at that point. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Well, my question is, and because I am sort of an insider, but um, how different is the Pacific area with respect to hurricanes, or whatever they call them, cyclones, typhoons, and compared to the Atlantic area? Because the Atlantic actually affects us. The Pacific doesn't affect us that much. Every so often, one storm does affect us, but it's mostly China and Taiwan, that area. But how different are they? Is there any different, or do they look the same? No, they're enormously different. Um, the Pacific is much more prolific uh, than the Atlantic on a, in a typical calendar year, because there in the Pacific, the, the uh, generation of tropical cyclones occurs throughout the year. Uh, you know, both, uh, it, it, there, it knows no season. I mean, in the northern hemisphere part does, in the southern hemisphere, but since both are part of the Pacific, uh, they just keep cranking them. I think that is the number of order of 60, does that number sound correct? I, th I guess I would go with 30 in the western North Pacific. Okay, if yeah. you include the eastern uh, North Pacific, then you may be looking at 45. The average is, what, 10 in the Atlantic. Yeah. In an average year, there are 10 tropical storms and hurricanes. We've just, we're about to get number 21, Wilma is about to form. It may be forming right now. They may be making the call even as we speak. Uh, so uh, get prepared. The folks, uh, the media's headed to Florida. I, I, uh, the, uh, uh, and so there are about three times as many in the Pacific as in the Atlantic. It's kind of interesting. There was just a study. I, uh, we've gotten very interested in hurricane trends right now because of the, the Ritas and the Katrinas of the world. And there have been numerous studies coming out lately on how things are happening. And obviously, this uptick that has occurred in the Atlantic Ocean actually has not occurred in the Pacific Ocean. And this should not be surprising that, the, that, 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 the, the, that one part of the globe would be. But it sort of adds the complication that you say, oh, well, if we, oh, we're warming the world, and that's why we have more hurricanes in the Atlantic. Well, if we were warming the world, wouldn't we have more hurricanes in the Pacific or not? I don't know what the correct answer to the, all those questions are. But one thing I do know is that the Pacific, because of its vastness, and because of the tremendous amount of warm water that there is in the Western Pacific Ocean, 
is th thought of as sort of the crucible of climate of, uh, as it expresses itself on the Earth, because so much heat is being exchanged between the air and the atmosphere in the Western Pacific that it's one of the dominant forces uh, in shaping the climate. But, of course, the Western Pacific is connected to the Eastern Pacific, is connected <laughs> to the Atlantic, and it, it's a complex puzzle. But it's a very interesting area of the Earth that, that, uh, to study. Well, we have Wilma coming. We have Fred. <clears throat> what, what Where's else do we Dino? Need? Yeah. Barney. Who wants to be Barney? <laughs> uh, if that's it, is that it? Yes. Um, you guys are... Uh, a lot of, I think, what you're talking about with the media, and the, obviously that's an extreme example, um, <laughs> sort of emblematic of this whole notion of it, if it bleeds, it leads. Yes. You know, that, uh, that, that, that is sort of a, a function of corporate journalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there is a, a, a solution to that that doesn't involve all of us converting to socialism. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, when we have these sort of scary stories connecting climate change and human activity, that it does sort of... There's a silver lining there. Uh, I do think that it sort of raises the public discourse on other environmental stewardship issues, like pollution and air quality, uh, things like this. And I was wondering, running, what you guys thought of that? Well, I, I think I don't think there's uh, there's any question that that we need to be become much more responsible uh, toward our environment. Uh, that you know w whether there's uncertainty with regard to the exact cause of the warming trend or where we may be going in the next uh, 50 to 100 years uh, does not play down the importance that we are stewards of, of what the Earth has. Uh, and as a result, uh, the, you know, we know that the fossil fuels are, are a limited resource. Um, we know that, that burning them has uh, negative effects on the environment. Um, so, so clearly, you know, they're, they're the quicker we can make a trend toward uh, reusable uh, energy, the better off we'll be. Uh, and and uh, <clears throat> insofar as bringing to our attention, you know, if the hype part has its downside, then the awareness of, of uh, needing to be more um, conservative about our, about our natural resources and, and a better uh, use of our environment, there's no question that that's a plus side. I would associate myself with those remarks, but at the same time say that if you're going to make discourse is good and understanding your need for stewardship, stewardship is good, but if you're going to make wise decisions about how it is you interact with your environment and indeed use your environment for, for the betterment of, 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 of humankind, uh, that you need good information upon which to make decisions not hyped information. And my concern is that everything now runs at such a high level of hype that we're constantly glomming on to that as the reason to make a decision. And I think that's a bad way to make a decision. But I understand that actually hype has a great, uh, a great history. The history of hype is important because people who, who hype the issues are the ones who bring attention to it. If you don't have a little hype going on on the, on the negative side and the positive side of an issue, the mushy middle is never going to deal with anything. Hopefully, though, uh, the, 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 the wisdom that comes out of, uh, of the process will be uh, one where you make a decision not on the hype, but on the facts. Mm -hmm.